Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Um, welcome to uh, the Ask Metrolinx Town Hall. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, my name is Mark Childs. I'm the Chief Marketing and Acting uh, Communications Officer, and I'll be your moderator this evening. It's my, my first time at the podium here, so uh, uh, I look forward to uh, engaging and, and chatting with you alongside uh, my, my colleagues. I want to, to, first of all, thank you on behalf of our entire team uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks uh, to the Scarborough community and uh, the Civic Center for hosting and welcoming us uh, this evening. I also uh, would like to uh, welcome uh, esteemed guests um, who uh, may be in the audience and joining us later. Um, I also want to uh, welcome our online guests who are uh, watching us on live stream. Um, throughout the evening, we will take questions from the floor as well as uh, questions uh, from the online audience. We are at Metrolinx uh, committed um, to engaging the communities uh, in which we operate and, and uh, are building, and we um, are looking for, uh, forward to a transparent and open uh, two-way conversation this evening with you. Um, we, of course, are excited about the changes um, that are um, among us now as we think about uh, the, the, the evolution and, and strength of uh, transit in our region. Um, but before we start off tonight, I want to do uh, quickly um, address safety. Safety is our first uh, priority at Metrolinx. Um, and so, um, as is accustomed uh, in, in our organization, when we come out into the community, uh, we'd like to reinforce that, that message to ensure that everyone gets home safe every day. Um, so we will do a, a very quick briefing here. So first of all, um, in this building, um, there is a, a two-stage alarm, um, and that will give us instructions um, on to, uh, to leave the building. The exit for us in this particular venue is the door behind you, uh, and we'll move out into the square, which is the muster point. Um, there are first aid kits, uh, automatic defibrillator um, at the security desk, just on the other side of the stairs uh, to your left. Um, and um, uh, we have a team that's ready to move into action should the needs arise, hopefully not. Um, so Peter Bailey, if you, if you could wave when your name is uh, addressed, please. Peter Bailey will call 911. Susan Walsh is our designated and trained first aider. Uh, James Birchall uh, will escort emergency services uh, to the situation should the need arise. Thank you, James. Um, and uh, we could, if we could ask you to look to your left and look to your right, um, just to take a visual cue of who's next to you. Uh, when we leave the building, should we need to, if we arrive at the muster point, we'd just like you to please just check that that person on your left and right is, is with us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we typically also have a safety moment. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on our leadership team uh, has a safety moment um, to share with us. We typically just bring safety to life in a very real and meaningful way. Martin. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name's uh, Martin Gallagher from Metrolinx. I look after safety. So um, we're obviously approaching the winter. Um, I'm from the UK, so it feels like we're already in deep winter. Um, but just to, to remember that the roads and are out there, that are out there are slippery and icy and black ice and pretty treacherous walkways, so to take care during, during this period of time and to take care when you're leaving the building tonight. Thank you. So before we, get beginning, we begin, um, we'd just like to uh, quickly uh, and importantly um, acknowledge uh, with a land acknowledgement um, where we are uh, today. Um, so um, we are on the territory, uh, traditional territory of many nations, in particular the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on these lands and has a responsibility to work with the original keepers of this territory and the many diverse indigenous peoples living here today. Thank you. So with that, without further ado, um, I'm just going to quickly run through um, the, the order for this evening. So we will be taking questions from the floor. If you um, have a question that you would like to uh, ask of our, our executive team, um, there is a microphone in front of you. If we could just uh, please uh, uh, create an orderly line behind uh, the microphone, and we'll uh, ask you to pre please, as promptly as you can, ask your question so that we can uh, share with you your answers back. We'll alternate between, uh, obviously, uh, the folks here in the room who've come with questions, with some of the questions that we're receiving online, um, and questions that were received uh, in advance and voted on by the online community. So we'll, 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 we'll move between the two. Um, if, um, and and as after we rotate through, rotate through those questions, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through as many questions 
questions as we possibly can this evening. All questions, though, uh, will be uh, answered and posted online um, after the event. So with that, um, I will uh, please pass to our president and CEO, Mr. Phil Burster, uh, to share with you our panel members and a quick a brief introduction. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we started these uh, Ask Metrolink sessions about 18 months ago. Um, and, and the reason why we did it was to be transparent, to come out to communities, um, to talk, to share, but most importantly, to also listen. And so what's great about these sessions are um, you're going to get the straight answer as, as we have it. We're gonna, we, we, we welcome anyone to ask any question, and what, we, what we'll share and what we can share, we will share. And I, and I think that's really important, because what we have seen at nearly all of these gatherings is a, sort of a very receptive audience, and people ask questions, and, and uh, we, look, we, 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 want to be, we want to be in a place where you can know that when we come to the region, um, you'll be able to come to us and ask, ask us any question. What we, the only thing we ask from you this evening is let's give everyone a chance um, to participate in the session. And, uh, and, and we've brought a whole team. We've got quite a lot of our people here that's going to answer questions. Um, and so if anyone on our panel who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves just now, if we can't answer the question, there are other people in our team that will be able to answer questions as well. So um, just before we start to introduce people, I just want to use the opportunity. Our company secretary couldn't be here tonight. So I'm going to ask, I just want to introduce Dorothy Wahl over here. So Dorothy is standing in for our company secretary. Dorothy, do you want to get up quickly? <laughs> Dorothy is a lawyer, and so um, she's available for free legal advice <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Real estate transactions, constitutional law, divorce cases, anything like that. So, so in any case, we are all here to give, you, to give you answers tonight. So welcome, Dorothy. Thanks for standing in. And so we'll start off with Stephanie. Hi there. Uh, Stephanie Davies. I'm the EVP of Go Expansion. Sorry? What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, Go Expansion, so I'm uh, responsible for the infrastructure associated with the service increases. That, um, that we're working towards to increase uh, service on our entire Go network, so infrastructure. Hello, so my name is Matthew Getsky, and I'm the Chief Planning Officer. I'm Annalise Cherney. I'm the Executive Vice President of Presto. Ian Smith, Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. Thank you. So, let's go. Okay, so I think we, uh, we have a first question. I think we're going to post the first question. So the first question um, is one of the voted questions online uh, related to Kennedy Station and Eglinton East, uh, LRT. Um, how much future compatibility is Metrolix and Crosslix building into Kennedy Station terminus of the Crosstown LRT? And I'll leave the question abbreviated. Um, so I think, Stephanie, you want to take this one? Yep. Yeah, this is a, a great one and an easy one for us. Uh, we have accounted for the extension of Eglinton, uh, current Eglinton Crosstown East into the existing construction that's going on there, and we will be able to accommodate that extension um, when that takes place. That, that project is being led by the City of Toronto, um, but we were, are working collaboratively with them to make sure that um, all requirements are considered. And let's take our first question from the floor. If you'd just like to introduce yourself briefly and ask your question. Yes, my name is Peter Meisek. I live in Markham. Um, I know there's a question already in the top 10 on YRT, uh, TTC fare integration. I was going to ask that, but I had a second piece, which is the Go TTC piece. Uh, my understanding is the provincial money has run out. Go has decided to generously honor TTC people that are entering the Go system with some sort of a discount, but TTC hadn't made a decision yet on whether to do it the other way around. Can, can someone give me an update on where that sits, please? Um, yeah, so, so you're right. I think we, we've been working a lot with DTC and with other municipal operators on how to make both the fare experience uh, more seamless and, and then also to harmonize some of the fares across the region. So we do have a, a pilot uh, that, was, that has been running for the last two and a half years called the Discount Double, double Fare. Double Discount, yeah. Right, right with, uh, with the TTC. So that it was, it's been scheduled to end at the end of March of 2020. So right now what we're doing, we're still evaluating that, uh, the effects of that on ridership 
because the, the objective of that is really to, to see how it can continue to grow ridership and to make sure that the volume of riders that we get from that reduced fare basically compensates for, for the lower fare that both are right. getting. So we're evaluating that. So there are surveys that will be uh, made at the station, so in, in the first quarter of 2020. So if you, if you benefit from those, you'll, uh, okay. you might be part of that survey. And from that, I'll, from that, that will enable the TTC and ourselves and the province to make the right decision with the city. So no decision's been made one way or the other yet. You're, just, you're still evaluating, is that That's correct? Right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We'll take another question from the floor, please. Good evening, Rhoda. Good evening. Rhoda Potter, uh, president of Agent Court Village Community Association, and I'm back again regarding Agent Court Station. I want to address the Agent Court Station on the Stovo Corridor. A station where the parking lot is full by 7 a.m., 7.30 in the morning. A station within walking distance of 5,000 built, con newly built condominiums, and soon to have 5,000 more condominiums in Agent Court Mall. As you are aware, AVCA is very concerned about safety. You've heard us many times talk about the children, the residents, and the commuters. In 2013, a grade se separation was completed over uh, Shepherd Avenue with no accessibility to the station for physically handicapped or challenged people except by car. In fact, this week when a train was canceled and I had luggage, had to make my way to Shepherd Avenue to pick up your GO bus. It does not come into the station. Metrolinx encourages walking or cycling the last mile. Metrolinx is building a pedestrian bridge over Steeles Avenue in an industrial area. Has plans for accessibility and connectivity in Lincolnville and Davenport, as well as preliminary plans for Finch Avenue. When will Metrolinx work with the city, with Agent Court developers, and with the community to address the pedestrian accessibility and connectivity to Agent Court GO Station? Thank you very much for that, Rhoda. That's a great, that's a great question. And, and when you and I walked it, we, we saw where that, it's, it's the only place is as you come up by car yeah, into the park. Yeah, that's the only way you get yeah. there. Not even, a TT, not even a go bus yeah. can go in there. It's a piece of work that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Another one from the floor. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, my name's Don Booth. Um, I'm a member of the Lakeshore East uh, Community Advisory Committee. Um, I have a question uh, about noise walls, uh, one of our many concerns. Uh, in 2017, Metrolinx almost smartly stepped into the 20th century. Uh, you, as, as I understand it, make your decisions on where you will mitigate noise according to interim regulations from 1995. Uh, on the basis of that, you're planning to build noise walls in some communities, not in others. In, in my case, neighbors on the north side of the tracks will have noise walls. Those of us living on the south side of the tracks will not, even though we're all, I guess you could say, spitting distance from the trains. It makes absolutely no sense. All of us will experience a train every 3.5 minutes from 5 a.m. until 1 a.m. In 2017, at a meeting that was hosted by Peter Tavins, one of our MPPs, uh, representatives from Metrolinx came forward and said, we recognize the mistake. Uh, here is a map overlay of where we really need to have noise walls. Here's roughly what it's going to cost. And not only that, but we have people working very, very hard to upgrade our regulations so that we can, in fact, be 20th century. Um, and all of that has completely disappeared with really no explanation, not even an apology. So when is it coming back? When are you gonna do the right thing? Because the regulations that govern your decision making in the real world, especially with the train service that we have now and the train service that's coming, make absolutely no sense. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks. Thanks for your question. So, uh, and I'm not sure exactly where you are on, on the Lakeshore East, but regardless, um, there, is, there is still lots of work happening in that corridor. Um, we are reviewing and doing a network-wide study um, that will be commencing, or already commenced, will, in which we'll be doing public engagement early next year. That will uh, be for the review of noise mitigation system-wide for all of GO expansion. So we will be back out in the community next year talking to you. We recognize that we haven't um, been out there since, since as you say, the, the 2017 public meetings. Um, there have been um, additional uh, advancements of design in that corridor that we have been, we've been working on. Um, and we will be ready to come back out uh, early next year to, to talk to you about that. So we're aware of this and all we've received is that like we're kind of working on it and there's going to be some changes. Nothing about why. Not, nothing about the regulations underneath all of this. So can, can I explain? Can I explain? Because it's, uh, and, and I think this, so, so my understanding, um, and I'll share, I'll share the, I'll share the facts, and I'll, I want to because it's always good we start there. And so my understanding was um, that we have been trying, or that we had shared this. If we haven't, then let's share it now. So here's the challenge: how the noise regulations work is when you run more trains and you move from a sound level that's here to a sound level that's higher beyond a certain peak, then you have to put noise, um, because it's a step change, you have to put noise, noise barriers in. You follow? So if, if on corridors where we run very few trains and the noise level is there and it grows by, and I don't know what the exact percentage is, is in the noise regulations, we're obliged to invest in noise investment. So, the, where this idea, that regulation, which we'll comply with, where that regulation really doesn't work well, is that on a busy corridor like the Lakeshore, where we run many trains and the noise level's already there, and we now run more trains, and the inc but because the increase in trains is only a small proportion of the total number of trains, the noise increases by only so much, which is still sort of significant, but because it doesn't increase beyond a certain level, under the regulations, it's not a requirement to invest. And we've said, whoa, that doesn't sound right from where, our, from where we are sitting and what we want to do on the corridor. So the plans that we are working on now is to do more investment in noise walls beyond what the regulations ask of us. And I think that's the really important point. And if we've not succeeded to convey that, I apologize. Because that is the issue we're dealing with. Now, if you, if, if you take, um, and, and again, Rhoda and myself, a couple of months ago, if you go and look at the Stover line, um, the, the, these noise barriers that we're putting in place, these noise walls, they're pretty substantial, um, significant, significant noise walls. And so what we are, what, what we are doing now is that's a, we're busy going through the process to figure out what's the, what's the investment, where would it go, what's the noise level, and what we would do. And, 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 and if, if we just sort of, if you give us a little bit of latitude, we'll come back and communicate with, a, with, with, your, with, your, with your group um, somewhere I, in the I'm, early I'm New Year. I'm sorry to interrupt, but what you've just said runs exactly counter to what we've been told. That's interesting because that's what I think the, the current regulatory position is. So, so that's what we're working and, on. And the, the problem is not only, and boy, this is the root of the problem, that which, which Metrolinx identified some time ago, and I'll step down after this, that the problem is the regulations. If you look for no, example- so Can the, I just say, so, sorry, I just want to say, and we didn't say the problem is the regulations. I didn't say the problem is the regulations. I just want to say, what we want to do is we want to do what's best for the people that are our neighbors on the railway. And so whatever the regulations say, whatever the regulations say, we're going we're gonna to come with a proposal on what we think can, is best able to work within that environment. I'll just give you an example. Can I just give you one example? On some of our, some of our communities just outside Union Station um, that have uh, part of their apartments that faces back onto the railway. Crombie Park. Yeah. 
So, so, and I'm not sure exactly where we are with that, but there was a whole campaign to help to, to, to deafen some of the noise, which a sound wall, a noise barrier, wouldn't be able to, to clear. Yeah. And, and that included things, I'm not sure what it was, what all the things were, but there were seals around the windows. There were triple, I think it was triple, yeah. triple glazing, um, seals around the doors. None of that is required to be done by us, and we've proceeded, I think we've proceeded we with have, that. We have, yes, we've reached agreement with the community and we're going out to, just to complete the design to do that work uh, in the spring of next year. And we shared that with the community. So I just want to, just want to say, please, if, if we haven't communicated this well, um, then, then we apologize, but here's the thing. Um, we, we understand this issue, and we are looking at where, where the necessary um, investments need to be made to get that degree of noise deafening that's, that, that would help. So can we come back to you? No, I want to hear before that, but I'll... Thank you. Thank you for your question. We're going to take a question from online. Just, uh, I believe one's going to pop up on the screen. Here we go. So it's from the live stream, and a reminder uh, that we are joined this evening by folks uh, watching live online. So at the Ajax GO station, the traffic to get us in and out is treacherous. Are you planning to increase lanes to deal with the traffic? I think... Matt. Sure, I can, I can take that one. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. We, we know a lot with the, with the increased services and increased ridership that we see a lot of our stations. Um, a lot of the, the usual and the dominant way to get to many of our stations is still uh, driving. So traffic is, is increased and, and there, are some, there are some safety uh, issues sometimes at the crossings nearby. So in terms of safety, we, we work very closely with the municipalities to see how the entrance and the exits to the parking lots fit in, in the local grid. But we know that in the future, we will not be able to continue to increase lanes to increase the throughput to the parking lots and build more parking spots. So what we're looking into now, and uh, so we've had already many pilots on pro providing the right incentives for people who live nearby uh, to be able to walk or cycle comfortably to the station. Or where we've been working a lot with municipal service providers to find the right incentives also and, and help, uh, help to the, the people to take the local buses so they can take the local bus to get to the, to the GO station. So I think this is, this is the direction in which we're going because we can't always increase the, the, the lanes and increase the parking. We're already at a very significant, we have uh, more than 70,000 parking spots in our, in our portfolio that is significant, that's very important in some communities where there are no alternatives but everywhere else, we have to work out all these alternatives to get to the station. Thank you, Mathieu. Take another question from the floor, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Adrian Press. I live in Leslieville. And uh, my question is about the new Ontario line. Um, I'm glad we're expanding public transport. But I have some questions about uh, the proposed Ontario line south of Girard approaching Eastern. <laughs> Currently, it's being planned to be built above ground. Um, on that route, there are six bridges, there are community centers, parks, there's a 21 floor apartment complex not far away. What I've been told, and maybe you can correct me, is that it's being pushed through pretty aggressively and the community environmental appraisal, there hasn't been a cost analysis of above ground versus below. So I'm wondering if it's been considered to be put underground for many reasons I've only scratched the surface on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. So I'm, I'm going to get some of my members of the team to respond as well. So, um, but but let's let's go to the heart of the question. It's a, it's a very important question. When you look at transit systems um, and where different different transit lines interface with each other, um, you, you have what you call the transfer ease of transfer between lines. What's really important about the Ontario line is it connects with other lines, line one, line two, Eglinton, as well as Lakeshore East and Lakeshore West, seven, seven interactions with other lines. And we're trying to create those interactions to be um, as, as interchangeable as possible. So to make the time that is lost by a passenger transferring from, say, a GO service onto a um, onto the Ontario line as little as possible. The reason why 
Um, and and uh, if, if I just build it up somewhat, and, and you can understand how we think about this and, and how, it, uh, how it works for, for, for transit economics. In terms of transit economics, the total journey time is what has the economic benefit. And so because that frees up um, personal expendable time for the user, time to work more, time to have quality of life. And so the challenge we had um, when you look at um, going underneath the Don is, and correct me, is it 41 meters? I think it yeah, 41, 41 meters. meters. So, so at East Harbor, and East Harbor is literally um, the most important second, we, we, we see that East Harbor is going to develop into the most important, <coughs> second most important station after, after Union with regard to footfall. There's 41 meters underground and six or seven, es seven yeah, six, escalators six. To, to get back up and to do a transfer. So, and, and 41 meters is like, it's like massive. I'm not sure how much that is, but it's, it's really significant. So the time duration lost on the transfer was, 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 was very high. It was very expensive. So, so in terms of your, your question on cost, um, uh, a, a fact, which, which is which two facts, which is not always, uh, one is obvious, one isn't that obvious, but if you think of quite a lot of underground systems, such as London Underground, literally about 40, I think this is 48% of London Underground runs above ground. So, so the practice where you have subways that at times run above ground, at times run underground, is common practice throughout the world. Now, that doesn't mean we have to do it, but we have to look at, uh, carefully look at every example and say, well, what will, what will you do here? Will we run the above ground or underground? So, so by running it, instead of going underneath the Don, coming, surfacing up on the western side of the Don, um, get as close as possible into the rail corridor and run above ground um, through, through um, East Harbor, um, we will at East Harbor then create a situation where the GO trains run in the middle of the corridor. We have a platform on the side and people will literally be able to cross the platform only five steps, seven steps or eight steps from a GO train into a transfer rather than 41 meters of climb. And that has huge economic value. Um, our corridor on that, uh, from there when it runs above ground, um, we will, we will, that corridor was going to take trains somewhere in the future, sort of in any case. They say that, so train rail capacity is, is what that corridor would have been used for. So, so yes, we did consider it. The second, sorry, the second fact that's really perhaps obvious, and, and forgive me, I'm just saying it's obvious, but to go above ground is significantly cheaper than to go underground. Um, underground, you have excavation, soil, and, and, and those types of things to consider. So we did consider the cost item. The cost item to not go underneath the Don is quite significant. The transfer issue um, for rail is really important um, to get passengers to transfer. I want to go to the heart of, of, of what the concern could be, and, and, and Kelly will talk to you about the things we will do, the things we're planning, and we're starting the consultations um, Susan is here as well, uh, can talk to the consultations that starts with communities in, in January, is that there are, today there are many, many different techniques where you create quieter running than what there has been for many, many years. Um, you have things like continuous welded rails, so there's not this linking of rail where it goes ka-cluck, ka-cluck when it goes over it. Underneath the track you can put rubber, what's called rubber pads, basically what the rail sits on to make sure it doesn't make the sound that you hear on line one sometimes, um, that, that, that you can hear on line one when you walk um, in, in Young Street and you hear the, the subway go past. So all of these things about how do we create the, the, the sound, um, uh, mitigate the sound effects, mitigate the operational effects, is what we're looking at now. And in our <coughs> environmental assessment, when the options are generated, we'd look after those things. Sorry for the long answer. I just want to give you a sense of it. Um, can Richard quickly, Richard, did I leave anything out? Uh, no, I think you covered most of it. All right, Kelly. 
No, I just wanted to point out too that we are going to be consulting with the community and going out as often as we can as early as the end of January and community offices will be opening as well because while this is a, a new idea and a, an idea that we are working on very hard on the technical side, we are very dedicated to making sure that the communities are brought along in those decisions and that you're not left wondering. Um, so those public meetings and those opportunities to engage is really important to us and we're fully committed to coming out and communicating with you as early and as often as we can. And, and if I can explain why we've not been out yet is um, we are, we, we've been working extremely closely with the TTC. They, they are great people. Uh, we've taken over um, sort of quite, we, and we're using quite a lot of their ideas. Um, but because the alignment is, uh, the route, sorry, it's a we, railway people talk about alignment, basically what we mean, the route, we're thinking about the route and where the route goes exactly. Um, the, they are sort of, where do the stations go? Because the alignment, as you say, is slightly different than what was originally envisaged. And so we want to settle down what that is before we come out to the community. Uh, and I appreciate all the answers. I know you're thinking about us. I hope at some point we can perhaps be listened to for maybe modifying these plans. I know that originally the station um, just near Eastern, yes. 10 years ago was told to be you, not you mean, Do you mean East Alba? I believe Eastern. so. Okay, yeah, yeah. But I was told about 10 years ago that was deemed to be inappropriate for a station, and now all of a sudden it's being okay for a station. So that's the thing we're trying to understand. Oh, that's if fine. If you truly are gonna yeah. build it above ground, you know, will there be expropriation? How are we, the residents, Gonna, gonna deal with this. So we're looking for communication and hopefully some, some open ears as well, truly. Uh, absolutely, so, so, so thanks for that. You, you're absolutely right. Um, um, we, we, we will most definitely come and talk. Uh, we will, the, the big thing at this stage is get that environmental assessment done. So here's what environmental assessments do for you. When we do an environmental assessment, we figure out um, the environmental assessments typically generate options. Um, under what circumstances, what different options do we have and how does it mitigate an effect over here rather than over there and, and how the options fit together. Once we have done quite a lot of that technical work, um, we do come, we do listen, and Susan has a great way of explaining how those listening sessions work. Would you like to add something there, Susan? We Community couldn't be more important because not only are we operating in your community, you're also our customers. And we are also parts of other communities as well. So we are more than happy not only to have, to come speak to your, your organizations, to listen to your organizations. We've done a couple of that with the information we have so far and we say, look it, this is what we know so far. We'll tell you more when you can, happy to do that. But we'll also have not only the um, open houses at the end of January. We'll also have uh, sessions on Metrolinks Engage, the platform that this is on. There'll be online questions and answers and a chance to um, engage us on an ongoing basis. And, and then we have the PICs then, which are formally regulated type meetings, aren't they? Yeah, we'll be having um, PICs also for the Scarborough Extension that as PICs well. PICs are just sort of public interface Public Information Center, sorry, yeah. So it's part of the environmental assessment program whereby, so there, there are just formal places where we'll come and listen and, and we give you that assurance. The thing is, when you build a subway in the middle of a city, um, you just look at Eglinton. Um, we are learning less, we are we are learning lessons from Eglinton and we are figuring out how to make it less disruptive and, and especially where it's right in the hearts of communities. You cannot do this without listening to the community and working with the community. So we've got a whole team set up around doing what we call the community interface, the community relations. For to speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Phil, and the team. Um, just a reminder, um, we are joined online um, on metrolinksengage.com. It's uh, 7.30, and uh, if you're joining us, we're in the Scarborough Civic uh, Center taking questions. We're going to take another question from the floor, please. Hello. My name is Nana Jug. I live in Markham. Pleased to meet you. Thank you. Same here. Um, just a little bit of history. There used to be, going through Markham, there used to be two separate 
chain banks or batches, whatever you want to call them. One was the morning, one was the afternoon. There was a break in midday. You uh, mean like train? Right, from a couple, let's say a couple six of trains. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, six yeah. o'clock to nine, yeah, whatever yeah. that was, five, six trains. And then they, they, would, they were returning in the evening. And then uh, we introduced uh, the midday trains. Yes. And since I live on the tracks, so to speak, I was able to sort of peek through the window and see how busy those trains were. So uh, I did send an email to Metrolinx and uh, eventually got the reply. That communication is not as good as you make it sound. Uh, get that the reply and it turned out to be about 20 people per train. So we were all scratching our heads, the neighbors were when we were talking and said, <laughs> There's a lot of money going down the drain there. And then, lo and behold, the night shift gets introduced. So these are the trains from 9 to midnight. Now, I don't have to tell you that they are even more empty than the midday trains. But that's not the end of the story. Now we have weekend trains. Yep. And from <laughs> what I can see, more than half of those trains are completely empty. There is nobody there. This is a beast that can carry 1,000 people and there's nobody there. So my question is, first of all, what kind of business sense does this make? Yep. And then what promoted this kind of a explosive growth without, okay, we all test waters, we all want to create demand. This is what the business is about, right? Especially transportation, it is a service. Nobody expects you to make a killing, to make big bucks. But I think we would be better off by getting a cab for each one of those passengers to take them home and keeping those trains parked nicely. You wouldn't have extra maintenance. You wouldn't have to pay for engineers. You wouldn't have infrastructure cost, also maintenance, that you will encounter just by running <coughs> empty trains because they're way more heavy than all the people on them. Thank you very much. Excellent question. So it is really an excellent question. Thank you. So, so the... the um, so. so so I'm going to share two, two different types of ideas uh, with you on this because... Ideas or solutions? Solutions. All right. This is, this, we, are in, we, are in, we are doing this with a very deliberate, specific reason. When you, when you develop a new train service, especially one which is so very different to what we've had before, this, the, the service that existed before, exactly as you explained, was like a, a single directional flow into the city in a single directional flow out. That had been developed over many, many years, tens of years, decades. That's the type of service pattern that there was. And that's what's become the accepted practice of, of, uh, of, of the usage pattern that we had then. We are now changing on many different levels what we deliver as a train service because, because we're seeing growth right across the region. Um, and we, are, we have communities such as uh, the communities in everything from Durham, right across Markham, right across through to Niagara, right across down to, um, to, 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 to Waterloo and Kitchener, everywhere saying to us, our direction of flow of passengers is busy changing. So for example, take Pickering for example, which is just one Take Markham for example. Yeah, so everyone take because I've dealt with the mayor of Pickering on one particular example. With, with, in Pickering, there's growth in Pickering itself, and there's a strong demand. The mayor and the community and council of Pickering is saying four flows potentially from the city out to their growth in, in that city itself. Same is happening with, with Bowmanville, and I would, I would say to you, same is happening in York um, and, 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 the, and the Markham region. So, what we are doing as an, as an organization, please, let me follow through. No, 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 let I'm me just follow through. I just didn't so understand growth, what you said. Yeah. What did you say was happening in Pickering again? What was happening? So, instead of there being just a demand for people to flow into Toronto, as typically as in the past where, to, where Toronto was the center of where everything is going, what we are seeing is that cities themselves are becoming places of employment and work, so people are flowing in the opposite direction. So, in the morning, Instead of everyone going into Union, some people want to come from the city out to other places. Sure. And so, so here's the thing. You're right. 
not all of the trains are going to be full at this stage when we've just implemented it. So a couple of years ago, many years ago, in, um, in, in, when I was deputy CEO in, in Ireland, we ran a train out to a city on the west coast called Sligo. And when we ran the service, it was used to run it three hour, every three hours, and we changed it to every hour. It took us about three or four years. So people don't automatically stop using their cars. It takes time. It's sort of the saying in the railway is, build it and they will come. So it takes time for it to ramp up. But as it ramps up over time, people start to use it. To give you a sense of why, of the other things we are doing to stimulate this behavior, um, our minister announced a couple of, uh, about six or seven months ago, uh, a reduction in our base fare, which means the first 10 kilometers, anywhere from whatever station you get on, in the past you would have paid $4.70 for that 10 kilometer journey, you now pay $3.70. And that's again to stimulate flows in the short term um, but in the long term, between from short distance trips. And so a last thought, and, and, and I, know, I, I know how it feels when you look at this and say, w w why isn't the train full, full, full? The plans we are using is not just because we have blind faith that people will come or not. We've looked very carefully at what the growth plans are, what the settlement patterns are, where people are, are moving to, where they are living, where the growth regions are, where the employment regions are. And if you just look, for example, places like Vaughan, even Markham, and you look at the massive development, in Markham itself, that development just, just below the, 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 is it the 407, yeah, at, at Langstaff itself, there's a, there's a very, very significant, huge development in Markham where, it's, 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 the, the future is gonna look very different in terms of where people travel to, and that's what we're building for. So maybe I can just add in as, as the guy that's accountable for trying to get people, more, more and more people on those trains. I, I, what I would say is one of the things that we've known and we've, we've proven over at least the last 18 months, two years, is we have to help people see the reason why they would take the train. And, and so we have a team that is, is developing communication to help people see that they can come into this event, they can get to the game. That does require a frequent service. I can tell you, and I'm looking at the numbers right here, that we've seen month on month uh, growth in numbers. And actually, the, the Markham numbers I'm looking at right now for the last month were up 14%. Were up so we're seeing some s significant changes. I would uh, say when possible. those changes, when, no. when Oh, that's not possible. Absolutely not. With the amount of new rides that you have created, yeah. which is midday, which is nights, which is weekends, and on top of yeah. that, that's not possible. So, this so, was the so. answer I actually got from the lady that I communicated with for the midday. She brought it down in percentages. It looked impressive. But then when you look through the window, so you actually haven't answered my question. What is, how much, how many people it takes to make ri that ride break even? And why would we introduce something explosive, which is every hour back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, all these years we survived. Wouldn't there be a trial period? Say, okay, let's introduce these particular trains, see how busy they are, and does it make sense? Okay, it's busy, let's introduce more. Like no business does this just like that. Any business, any business that has a slow growth, slow adoption rate of customers do what we are doing. You invest in capacity because by capacity, you get people to, uh, to use the service. And the one thing that's a universal truth about railways are, the higher your frequency, the more likely it is for people to use your service. That's why services are really successful, typically run every 15 minutes. Now the Stover line, we're not near to 15 <coughs> minutes because the demand is not there. So on the Stover line, and the reason why that's true for transit, I'm just, I'm, just explaining the, I'm just explaining what's true in our world, so it's just to clarify. But are you bringing well, you want to North America or are you talking about North America? No, no. So, so we also, we talk about the same Europe thing. Europe is different. No. So, so can I just follow through? <laughs> yeah, well, so when people want to, when people decide I'm gonna use a train service, they, the best place they want to, the best place you want to put the customer in is when the customer says, I don't have to check a timetable. 
I can just arrive. I get that. And, and that's why a 15 that. minute service is on really busy routes the way we're going. And the 15 minute service that we have on Lakeshore East and we developed towards Lakeshore West, it's got huge growth. And so on our other lines, such as the Stover line, we have this investment that we are saying, we see where people are settling, we see where people are going to travel to in the future, this is the investment that will work for this for now. I still haven't answered my question. I, I do, I have. Okay, so how many people does it take per car to make it break even? Okay, um, when you look at our services, all of our services, and this is in the public domain, 68% of our costs are recovered by fares. We, we, we charge a very low fare, and so in terms, of, in terms of where we are today, all of our services, all of our services are in effect subsidized because our average fare is low, and therefore what we are moving towards now through the investment we're making on the Stover line, for example, where we've put a second track in and we're gonna run more services over time, we will get to break even by 2031. And so we need to increase 2031. our- 2031. So 2031. Oh, and, I'll and be dead by, by then. By 20, I hope not. <laughs> uh, so, by 20, so the reason for that is we, we're gonna increase the capacity and increase the number of riders between now and then. Why not test the waters? Why not do it slowly? Introduce five trains as opposed to 10. Cut the weekends down. Cut out the empty trains. Can I suggest, I we, do, can I suggest we do this conversation Absolutely. afterwards oh. so that other people can answer? All right, thanks questions. for trying. Th okay. thanks. So, uh, thanks for your question. We're gonna take uh, one of the top 10 questions um, and I think I'm gonna ask the question and I think then I'm actually probably gonna answer it. Um, so this actually is, is possibly related, particularly um, as the question relates to fares uh, being at a different rate um, off, uh, during off-peak hours. Why doesn't the Go Transit uh, have time-varying fares for off-peak hours? Um, I'm sure you've probably read quicker than I could read. Um, I would suggest that fares should be reduced on weekends and offer a special family discount for weekend events as well. Um, I'm actually really pleased to share with you um, in the spirit of, of trying to uh, continue to grow ridership on the weekends. Just last Sunday, um, we launched a pilot which will run right through early February. Um, which is, we've, we've, we've called it the Fun Day Sunday uh, promotion. Um, so using uh, one of our digital tickets, which can be uh, purchased online at, on our gotransit.com website, um, folks can travel uh, across the region for $10. Um, so again, we are trying to promote that ridership um, familiarity with getting into the city, coming out of the city, maybe going to visit family and friends, coming into that event for the holidays, or even stepping yourself to somewhere where you can actually do that holiday shopping. So we are seeing, albeit very early days, um, encouraging results from the first weekend. Um, and I say that will be running all the way through until February. Can I, can I add, Mark? Yeah. Uh, so also just wanted to, um, with respect to Presto, because that's on the digital ticket to test it out. Um, you may have seen, and for those who are on Reddit, people are already picking up. We've started installing new equipment in the 905 and, uh, and Go. The first ones are, the first new um, Presto readers are being piloted. And when the whole system is refreshed, so the new equipment is put in because it's out of date, um, uh, that'll have the software that, that gives the availability to do some of this interesting pricing. And it will mean actually to the earlier uh, conversation um, about actually being able to encourage folks to uh, uh, ride cheaper in the evenings or, or on the weekends and so on. So, we'll, so that'll come throughout the whole system. Um, but for now, Mark and his team are trying out some interesting things to get the good data so that we can actually prove that these are worthwhile investments. Thanks, Annalise. Um, so we're going to come back to the floor. And again, uh, for those online, we are live from the Scarborough Pacific Center. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good evening. My name is Shanta Sundarais, and, and I'm from Unionville. Good evening. Um, just to answer a question before I go to mine, the reason a lot of people don't take the GO train anymore from Unionville is because there's nowhere to park and there's no way to get to the station <coughs> if you don't have a car, because there's no transit that gets you there. So your, your trains are never going to fill up until there's going to be anywhere else for people to park or if there's going to be a bus that's going to get the people to the station. So you're not going to see an increase in traffic. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll respond to that after your yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, that was not. I was just a passing one. a comment based yeah, on yeah, that. Yeah, we'll respond to that. So about communication, I'm sorry I have to bring this up, but Mr. Vesta, I sent you an email on October 27th, no response. 
November 4th, I asked for the courtesy of response. No response. November 11th, I get some sort of response from stakeholder relations, but no name at the end of the email. I then wrote to you again on November 29th, still no response. So what, I would appreciate. What did, you, what did you write to me about? Anyway, so maybe you can go and check the emails. I will come to my question because, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I'm busy. I take time out of my day. I only write to you if it's important. So I would appreciate if you read my emails and I got some sort of response. So I'm talking to you about whistle cessation. You may know, some of you may know who I am. You may not. I've been leading the, um, the campaign in Markham to stop the horns. I think this is something that Metrolinx needs to plan before you bring in all day service. It should have been something in your plan. To be honest, you shouldn't have brought on the onslaught of trains. The mayor of Markham and all the councillors asked you to stop the onslaught of all these trains until whistle cessation had been brought in to all the crossings on Markham, and you refused. I don't know why, because half these trains are empty. You could have listened to what the residents in Markham had asked, finished the project, and then added the train. So we're very, very disappointed that you weren't listening to the residents. I thought that's what um, your colleague here said that you would do. You need to listen to what the residents want. There are two more crossings that we're still waiting for. McCowan and Burr Oak. McCowan does not need the horns anymore. That can be silenced today. It all has to do with the timing of the arms that come down across the road. We want that crossing silenced today. We'd like to know when the work at Burr Oak is going to be complete. Metrolinx is supposed to be doing that work for us. So if I could have an answer to that. The residents in Markham get woken up at 5.30 in the morning. On a Sunday and Saturday, they get woken up again. They don't get to sleep till past 1.10 at night because your trains come constantly. You don't live there. You need to think about the quality of life of people along the railway corridor when you implement your works. We understand transit. We welcome transit. But you need to think about our quality of life, which is something that you're not doing. Thank you for your question. Can, sure. I, can I respond to that? So thank you very much. You must be Shant Shanta. I am Shanta. Yes, Shanta. the infamous. Yes. Shanta, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll follow up in terms of the response or not. But let's just, can, can I just, again, let's, let's go into the space of where we deal with just the, the facts of our, our level crossings and level crossings and whistle cessation works. So the reason why we have whistles is to run trains safely. Um, we know about the safety. We know all that. If I, if I could just <laughs> finish. So, as, as, and, and I take from what you're saying, uh, you say that Metrolinx has to do the work. Now, I just want to clarify one thing. When, when level crossings are made safe by the municipality, not by Metrolinx, by the municipality, so that anyone that approaches the level crossing will be safe. And that's got to do with signage. It's got to do with um, advanced signage about the level crossing. Yes. We All know. of those guidelines is laid out by, by Transport Scotland. So Canada. Canada. Transport Canada. <laughs> so Transport Scotland. It's my previous life. Sorry. Um, Transport Canada. So I just want to, just and, and, I, and I make this correction very cautiously because we, we work very closely um, with Mayor Scarpetti, and I have personally, and if Stephen Hobbs was here, will tell you, I've personally reviewed on two occasions Markham's <coughs> uh, contractor, the Markham City, as well as our team, as well as our contractor, all, all of them in a room twice now to review what the progress is with this work. Quite a lot of the work with level crossing cessation is really not, it's not Metrolinx's work to do. It's the work that must be done by the contractor working on issues and property which is outside of our right of way. So it's, it's, it's on the roadway itself. It's on approach to the roadway. Fact is, you probably 
you, you're quite rightly properly not interested in should it be them, should it be us, should it be you, should we, you just want it stopped. And I understand that. And, and of the 13 level crossings, 11 of them have now reached the level of work. And some of the work that some of the contractors have done was not safe enough for us to stop the whistles yet. And so there's work that has to be completed. And the one about the arm that must come down is a really crucial one because if it doesn't work and a vehicle can't traverse the level crossing, it's not safe. It's got nothing to do with pedestrians okay. or stopping so, the horn. So, so I think the thing, the, the thing that you are asking for is very, very practical and very reasonable. The, the progress that's made by everyone to get these fi fixed and finished um, was targeted for, for, for as quickly as possible. However, at the same time... We're two years delayed. As I, I can just, I, I just say this again, you know, I, I know you look at us and I take anything that may have been delayed due, due to us, I, I will take that on. I've looked at the program very carefully and I called everyone in because I wanted progress across the whole patch. And it's, so I'm not going to go into a finger pointing. Okay, so can I, just I, say, can I know when um, those two will be done? Because that was my, one, my, one of my emails to you the, the three current, weeks ago. The, we, can come, we, can, we can give you the dates. My I think my, from my last review, which was about three or four weeks ago, was one of them happens before Christmas and the other one happens sort of somewhere in January. Okay, and, one, uh, the, and my other question is, since the mayor and council, and many of us are here this evening that were at that meeting, had requested that Metrolink delay the onslaught of all these empty trains, why were you, why were you not prepared to do that for us? For the same reason as we've discussed earlier, the sooner I start to build the service, based on what we see as the growth in the region, the sooner we build the ridership up over the months and years to come. So the quality of life of the residents really don't care then? So don't I matter don't, to you? I don't, think, I don't think it's that. No, that's uh, more important to us. So can, uh, Shansa, can I just? Ruin, like, people's so, no, no. That's right. No, no. That's right. No. Okay, can I just... Uh, so can, can I, I just finish? Can I just right. finish that? So there's a balance here in terms of we, we're running more services and we're running the services safely and there's an economic case behind it and there are, there are as many people that will use the increased services the sooner we run them. Yes, but right now, come with me on the trains. I've got a video of a train I took, 14 people on that train. Do you know how many people's quality of life has been ruined because of 14 people on a train? All we're asking, I don't think we're asking for anything too much. All we're saying is get whistle sensation in for all the crossings and then gradually add the, the additional trains. These additional trains right now are unnecessary and they shouldn't be put in until our quality of life is improved. That's all we're asking. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your question. I do obviously want to get to as many questions as we can today. So the next person, if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thank you for this town hall. I really appreciate the engagement and having the panel before us. Um, my name is Amy M. I'm actually here representing uh, a landowner in Curtis in the municipality of Clarington. Now, my concerns is actually a little bit different than the ones that we've heard earlier tonight, and it's with regard to the expansion of the Lakeshore East Corridor. Um, earlier on this year, uh, we understand that there is uh, a review taking place to reevaluate the preferred route uh, for this expansion into Bowmanville. Um, our concern is that the original environmental assessment was approved like 18 years ago and then reconfirmed in 2015. And I understand the constraints as to why this reevaluation is happening and the trouble of trying to have the track shared with CN. But my question stems is how did this progress so long before we realized that that was a major issue that needed to be reevaluated? Because my concern is there's been significant investments on all levels of government, including landowners and other private companies moving into these employment areas as outlined by both the region and even the province with the provincially significant employment areas. And now you're, you're thinking of changing the locations of these, 
these stations where there's been a lot of planning effort and investments made to date. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, what are really the next steps? And I know the next steps is the release of, of your case study. And from my understanding with this case study, it's only based on existing ridership or the ridership that would be available to support this expansion on that route. But I understand it doesn't take in consideration any of the investments, monetary investments made by all levels of government over the past 18 years, as well as all the landowners in that area anticipating this to come in. I mean, just in services alone, and servicing is very similar to transit. You build it, they will come. So, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of service infrastructure that's near complete uh, to, to serve this new yeah, MTSA. So I, I'm just I'm just left wondering how this got this far, and is there really no other option other than changing the route? Um, so that's so, my main concern. So there were there were four options. Um, there were four options being considered. Um, there wasn't there wasn't enough done in prior years, and, and you're 100 percent right. One of the most important areas was to figure out how to run trains on CP's corridor. Oh, I apologize. No, no, that's okay, that's <laughs> fine. The CPC and easily, they're, they're easily confused, they two freight companies, but CP's corridor is the key corridor. Um, what, what we haven't shared publicly yet, but probably give, just give you a sense of it, is the fact that we have, in the last six or nine months, moved forward significantly with CP on that corridor. We've worked very closely with Durham region, um, as you as you could as you probably know, one of the big things for us was how to get a bridge over the 401, which is going to be a very expensive bridge depending on where you build it. And whether it changes in how the GM factory works or not, we have now um, only recently agreed with CP that we'll use that bridge to get to the same place. To and and so the the, the infrastructure you refer to, all of the benefits of using that corridor all the way to Bowmanville. Is, is, now the, is, is now a feasible option. And the other three options were as feasible, and they weren't, it wasn't as if there were hundreds of millions spent on other infrastructure that would have been lost, but ni that's neither here nor there in the sense that the preferred option of the region is now the, is now the most practical option as well. And we're progressing very, uh, very, very much in sync with, with the Durham region. It's a very exciting development, and we, we're going through some of the technical issues with CP on how far the tracks must be separated from each other, but it's progressing significantly well. I'm really pleased to hear that, because the next thing I was going to bring up is that it stalls. It's not stalled. Yeah, it's, it's moving it's, forward, yeah. Yeah, because Durham Region is in their MCR. They've released their, la re released their last discussion paper. They have their land needs assessment. It's very, but very much how do needed. you deliver a land needs assessment without knowing where the transit's yeah. going to be and going? Durham region, is, Durham region is shoulder to shoulder with us. They know it, it, there's, 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 we, we work very closely with okay. Elaine and with John. And, and, and it's, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's now a, a great progress to figure out how do we get developers to support the funding of stations and to make that um, infrastructure really work for both the region as well as for, for GO. Okay, good. Because like I said, you know, Clarington as well is is waiting on a lot of their secondary plans and the, you know, this has been 18 years in the making and now it, it appeared since this wasn't information that was previously released that everything came to a halting grind. Yeah, it's not and, too okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Next question from the floor, please. That was, that just took <laughs> this is, this wind is, out of our sails. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess then, I, it was a follow-up. You answered a lot of the questions that I had. Sorry. My name is Konstantinos Kasekas. Pleased I, to meet you. I, nice to meet you. I own the land on the corner of, well, across the street from the proposed Curtis uh, station right on the corner of Baseline right. and Curtis, right there, just north uh, of All Baseline right. Road. Um, and yeah, I think now that you answered many of our questions, I think I'd like to reiterate, I, I know very differently than everyone else here, that you are correct that the GO stations in many, for many, many areas outside of the city do become a hub for employment. Yes. OPG 
OPG has now moved everyone. They, they've, you know, in the last 18 months, now that they've said they're going to extend the life, the the lifespan of the Darlington uh, uh, power uh, power center, they're bringing another 5,000 employees. That would not have been possible uh, without the the uh, station in the plans. Toyota has just moved to the area. They're now changing all their employment line or their the rezoning in Clarington because of this, and it's the only only viable option for us now. Uh, We've been working with this 18-year-old plan, and just the thought of having to realign could be devastating for many, many people in the area, especially employers and potential employers. And I just want to say thank you. That thank you very much. Comments. And Kelly, I think we, we need to think carefully how we get some of that messaging on Bowmanville more, more on a higher priority and get that out. We discussed that, something similar today, didn't we? <laughs> yes. Next question from the floor, please. Hi there, my name is Lisa Drew, and Thanks. I'm the chair of the Merrill Bridge Dog Park Association. And we were, we had Tina, I don't know her last name, but she came to meet with us, not this past fall that we just finished up, but the one before. And she told us that Metrolinx wanted to use our dog park as a staging for the equipment that Metrolinx needed to do this rail expansion. Um, our dog park is a very bustling dog park. We have over 130 people just on the emailing list. That's not including who's on with Facebook and Twitter, because not everybody wants to be on the mailing list. And we use the park at all times of the day. Now, our concerns are that we don't know how much of the park is supposed to be taken up by Metrolinx, and how long, and are you, we were told that some of the trees that are relatively new would have to be dug up to accommodate your equipment. Um, would they be relocated? Would they, would you be returning our park to its fair. That's lush? A, that's a fair question, yeah. Um, and because of all of this, like, we don't have, we're not funded by anybody. Yeah. We don't have money. We're just part of the city of Toronto. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to know what we're expecting from you guys because to use up a good portion of our park is just not feasible. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for the question. And I can clarify that because um, the work, as I mentioned earlier to the other gentleman about the Lake Shore East expansion, we have been progressing the designs. Um, and we know, know, know now that um, we, we, do, we are not intending to use the, uh, the park extensively for staging, but we do need to use part of the park to um, enlarge the culvert that is going under the tracks there in support of the small small. That's creek. different than what we were told, and I'm not on the mailing list for what needs to be done in the area. And whenever there is going to be something, a notice is taped up onto our message boards with like a day's notice yeah. and says we they want the whole park. Yeah. Okay, so and and we're still we are uh, we are not ready to start construction by any stretch. Um, we are still in procurement for that piece of work on on the Lakeshore East corridor, um, and we'll be we'll be um, starting work no sooner than 2021. Um, and we are committed, as Kelly mentioned earlier, to having uh, lots of community engagement and advance notice about when that work will be taking place. To answer your question about duration, that that. Um, the work we anticipate will be about four to six months, um, so it will not be for the for the full duration of construction, but will be needed to access that part of the corridor. Now, how do I get that information sent to okay. me? Yeah, and who would my contact? I'll be? pass you to I'm Kelly. Gonna, I'm going to actually connect with you after this here, and I'm going to get your information. We're going to okay. make sure we can sit down with you in the next couple of days and give you a little bit of info. That, that works because you. the community is very concerned, yeah. and they come up to me at the dog park. They yeah, email me. They like. And I have so nothing to tell them. let's try and help you there to make sure that you're informed so you can inform them. And the last thing I um, would like to ask is, over the winter we had a nice storm and trees came down and were landed on our fence, which is our only safety barrier between the tracks and us. There's nothing else. And the, it's very poorly maintained and all of those dying trees are falling and landing either in our park or on our fence, and it's really hard to find somebody to talk to about that. Let's get your information. Kelly will yeah. figure that. And we'll thank you in. very thank much. Thank you very much for your question and, and concern. I want to, sorry, I just want to finish answering your question, though. You asked about tree removal, if there's mm -hmm. any tree removal, and we are, we, um, we will absolutely be having a tree compensation 
um, strategy. So any for all of the work within Go Expansion, for any work that we do where there are trees that are impacted, we will at a minimum meet the bylaw uh, requirements in terms of compensation. And in, in lots of Put cases, we'll be back. going. Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's, and how do I find out what that minimum is? So they will put trees back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Next I'm actually a follow-up to this because I represent the community around the dog park. So that's Alder Grove Avenue, approximately 25 households, just west of Girard and right on the track. So we have um, houses that overlook the track and then just across the street. So am I hearing now that we have a commitment that that dog park is not going to be a staging site? Because the last I heard, there was going to be work from 1, one o'clock to 5 a.m. And that that staging site, which is right in our community, and my house is across the street from it, um, that it was going to be staging there, meaning I was going to have bulldozers and lights, and that the only window for construction was 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. So can, do I have this panel's commitment that that's not happening? So, so I just want to address the, the 1 a.m. To, to, to 5 a.m. in terms of construction. So. Um, we are. We do endeavor to to do our work in a way that will be impacting all of our communities um, as minimally as possible. Um, Lakeshore East corridor, as you know, is a very busy corridor already. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be motivating, incentivizing our the contractor to do work as much as possible during the day, um, and and we we look to um, I guess balance off the impacts to operations kind of in line with with impacts to the community because we we do appreciate that. Um, our work is is noisy and disruptive. It's uh, unfortunately that's that's the nature of construction. So I can't say that there won't be any work um, in that corridor overnight, uh, but we will we will uh, commit that we will provide um, notice uh, to community residents when when that work has to take place, and we will also motivate our contractors to minimize that as much as possible. Okay, but am staging, I? But the is, staging. The staging. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, well, well, like. I but I actually wanted to ask a question. Um, I. My understanding is when a contractor works for the city, there are regulations regarding noise and pollution mitigation. Are those same regulations ap applicable to Metrolinx? My understanding is that there is no noise regulation mitigation that applies to you guys. Is that correct? So because we are a provincial agency, we are not mandated to meet the city bylaws in terms of noise mitigation. However, mm -hmm. we have uh, worked with the city to create a noise mitigation uh, policy that we will be applying to all of our projects, which will uh, necessitate contractors to meet certain thresholds as well. Will so, you be sharing those with the communities that are going to be impacted by these contractors? I think we should. Yeah, yes, yeah. I, yeah. So, uh, and, uh, okay, so thank you for that. And then you were going to answer about the staging. So the staging, and, and, and perhaps, I need to, perhaps I need to clarify for myself, we can get back to you, but my understanding um, in, in, in getting ready for today was that, that the work that we'll be doing in that area will be not staging for the entire duration of construction, but there will be some disruption for, for four to six weeks as that work, as the work in that area with respect to the culvert under, under the tracks needs to happen. Okay, so that's a ravine, and that is, I, I understand that there's been an assessment done by the Toronto Regional Conservation. Are you going to be sharing that uh, with, the, with the community, the TRCA assessment? Yes, yes, we can do that. Um, so, uh, and I'm just going to keep reiterating just so that I understand that I understand. So, the only work that's going to be done, um, any, that no staging is going to be done in our park and in our co small community um, relating to the construction of the fourth line, but only the culvert that's in the uh, ravine. Did I hear that? And that B, that would take four to six weeks? Four to six months. So, months. Months. To put a culvert into the ravine? I know that ravine like the back of my hand, and the culvert that's there, I, and, and I'm not even, I'm actually, and then what about heavy equipment damage? There's, I also, mean, there's also a retaining wall that has to go in along the north side of, that, of the corridor in that area. So it's not just, the culvert is also, it needs to be expanded. Um, and we do have TRCA uh, right. approvals, and, and we've worked with them closely to make sure that we'll be doing that work in a way that is right. that should, manages. Should, so should, there's should. staging of four to six months that's going to be occurring in the dog park for the culvert. Yeah. Sorry, may I may I ask? I mm -hmm. think that what 
probably we should do is I'd be very happy to come to site and bring the people with me mm -hmm. and walk through where the stage that we're at right now mm -hmm. and what our timelines are for construction. We're still and, about and a we year can away, point out, and, but and I want to- And we can perhaps point out to the community exactly what the bits are. And hear been. directly from, from you who right. lives there mm -hmm. to ensure that we know exactly where there might be some um, disruptions where we can actually put a mitigation in place. So rather than trying to solve this here when I can't hear and see and feel what you're speaking, okay. maybe I could that would again, be great, and I'll and I'll make contact offline, with you. Thank you. And we can come That's to fine. site with the right people. I will. I'd, I'd like you. that very much, Thanks. and I'll introduce myself to you afterwards. Um, the idea of noise mitigation of working from one to five a.m. Though I understand the concerns, and I'm going to let the rest of the people. Um, speak their truth as well. Um, you cannot imagine the kind of misery that is going to be happening in my community if we're all up at one to five um, with bulldozers right in front of our faces. So um, I know that you're aware of that and I know that you, you, you're all professionals but you're also sitting in your own communities and I just want you to close your eyes and think of that every time you make a decision that's going to impact my life that way. Thank you for your feedback and Kelly will connect with you. Um, so we, we are coming pretty close to the end of our session. So if I could ask the people who have questions still, um, because there's quite a long line there, we're gonna try and get through as many as we possibly can. If you could please be as brief in your question and we'll try and be brief and but direct in our answers where we can be. So I'm gonna be super brief because there's a lot of important people. Um, and most my question actually mostly has been answered already. So, but I did stand in line, so I'm gonna use my time for 30 You're seconds, good. which is that there's a woman back there um, who clearly works, I don't know her, I don't know anything about her problem, she clearly works very hard and is a little bit at her wit's end, and you laughed at her twice. And that is incredibly, when she was trying to express her problem to you, and that was incredibly disrespectful. So my question now has become, while standing in line, would you please apologize to her for that? Apologize if I laughed at the wrong time, Chancellor. It was not intended. Not, that's not a real okay. apology. Okay, thank oh, you. Apology. Next question, please. Apologies. Hi, I'm sorry, this isn't going to be a question. I have serious concerns about Metrolinx. For one thing, you're a regional transit authority, and as we can see with all the people here today, your focus is very regional, and yet you're in charge of local transit in Toronto. Second, the, the Presto rollout has been very problematic, and at the last TTC Commission meeting, no one from, from Metrolinx would show up to answer concerns about service level deliveries. Third, your governance is not by elected representatives, as is the TTC. The TTC Commission, as flawed as it is, we can go down and speak. We can't do that at the Metrolinx board. The other thing is, this transit authority is very upbeat about P3s. The public has never been consulted about P3s, whether they're a good way to deliver transit or not. So I guess my question to you is, will you, considering that you're now taking over all transit delivery in Toronto, do some reflection and some consideration with regard to the way you are governed to make it more democratic? That's a very... Um, that's a... Yeah, that's a very, that's a very, very good question, which is sort of outside of my immediate mandate to even address the decision about how we are governed as a board. And, and there was a time when Metrolinx uh, was governed by, um, had a governance structure and a board that consisted of elected officials. I think. It, a couple of years ago that changed, and that changed by, um, by government legislation. So, so I, I appreciate the question. One of the things we do um, when we give our uh, board feedback on the, the Ask Metrolink sessions is we give them that sense of what the questions were about, and, and um, I very much respect the question you ask, and, and, and the the, the width and the broadness of, of your question about how it works with the TTC and, and the delivery we've got, and we'll f I'll feed that back to the board. Thank you. Um, if I could, um, if one of our team could respond to the to the rollout of, of Presto and the adoption rates currently. 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, as of Sunday, uh, DTC has stopped selling tickets and tokens in, in the subway network, um, although they do remain in some of the mom and pop shops and so on. Um, I'd say to answer your question uh, about attendance at the city council or commission meetings, uh, it's not standard. Um, I did respond um, personally, actually, um, officially to the to, and, and that response was included in the uh, in the uh, minutes of of the council meeting. It's not standard actually that we're invited. Uh, so um, although I, I've made myself open to meetings both um, in private with uh, with uh, the involved members of the TTC governance as well as obviously working day to day with the TTC leadership. Um, and and as uh, many of you know, the the Metrolinks uh, board uh, meetings are are uh, the, every every meeting has an open session available for public attendance and viewing. So um, we're always interested in questions. Um, to speak specifically about the TTC, actually, I think you know there's been a lot of public uh, interest, and as a resident of Toronto as well, um, I myself are, are very concerned that this uh, continues to get better and better. And I think we've done a good job of starting to turn the tide. There still are things that we have uh, work to do in terms of ensuring that the system and the customer experience gets better and better every day. Uh, and I think that is working. Um, but you know, we continue to have to work hard. That's our jobs. And so, um, you know, I'm always interested if there's specific feedback of things we can do. Um, and it's also balancing, obviously, the needs of the TTC riders. But with Go and uh, you know, Mississauga and Ottawa and all of the all of the system that use Presto. So uh, I think we're getting better. The the adoption rates are in the 80s in the uh, for the TTC, but we need to keep pushing. So any feedback you can give us is welcome. Thank you. We're going to try and keep things rolling because we are running out of time. We will stay behind afterwards to hopefully address any questions that we can't get to. But uh, your question, please. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Hayden, a Ryerson University student, first year of individual planning. So um, the Goal Transit have a very weird fare structure, which is from which zone to another zone, not about crossing how many zones, but a specific price for each of them. So from Highway 4, 7 station at Jane, and then going to Richmond Hill Center would cost you $4.13. Going all the way to Scarborough Town Center is only $3.70. And then going to Union Field Center, and you go and mark him go with $3.70. And then suddenly going two kilometers more to Mount Joy Go Station will be $6.02. <laughs> we haven't made it easy, have we? Yeah. <laughs> and then it made me so weird that because the gold train is too expensive, I, I live in Markham, so I would go all the way to Vaughan just to take that subway to downtown because it's cheaper. So is your, and your question? And my question is, can Metrain do a complete fair structure review? Wow. <laughs> wants to, uh, so yes. Um, I, there's actually work going on both uh, for the Go fair table and kind of rationalizing some of this. Um, for a two-second version of history, to speak to the, the question of originally Go was really just for commuters coming into downtown, basically to Union Station. And as routes got expanded and a service got added, um, bits got added to the fare table, but there actually was no rationalization of how this looked as a picture of, as a whole. So you're right, a review and actually kind of a simplification of the Go fare system um, is actually underway with Mark's team leading the charge. I'll add, however, that we're also looking at how the Go fares, uh, to Matthew's point earlier about uh, regional um, customer experience and the regional fare, to see what, and working with the municipal transit agencies, to make things both more simple, but also more coherent in terms of how pricing works. We are not in control of all of those decisions because there's a lot of municipalities, but where we can make things simpler, for instance, right now, looking at making sure that um, there are fewer different options, so as a student, there's too many things to choose between, and let's make it clear what's the best price for you and, and how to set your Presto card up easily. Um, those are things we're working on now. So we are very sympathetic, and we're working as hard as we can, as quickly as we can, to simplify some of those things. Yeah, and just we also need more discount for our post-secondary students. Yeah. Noted. Yes. <laughs> and if there Thank are you. any summer jobs, I can take you. <laughs> Come and we, talk to us we afterwards. We do actually come talk Excellent. because we do take interns as Metrolink, so please come also. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Well done. Next question, please. Hi. Um, my name is Robert, and I've got a follow-up question to that one. Um, I live in Etobicoke, and I yeah. took the Up Yours train. I call it the Up Yours train because I pay, help pay, pay for it, and you guys put $27 
for a fee to ride it. Wait, like, wait, obviously, it's sorry, not wait. for me so, to use. So, sorry, explain that. Did I, I didn't understand that. Okay. Um, initially, when they built the up yours train, it was twenty-seven dollars to ride. Oh, it. sorry, the, the, the express. express. For the I episode. call it the oh, up sorry, yours I, I, because I, I didn't follow. Because that's I'm yeah, yeah. Like, sorry. Even now, like, I've caught on. People actually are using it now because you finally dropped the price. Dropped the price, yeah. And I actually took it tonight to come here. Right. I went down to Union and came up to Kennedy Go and took the RT here. Oh, right. $12. Yes. So $24, it just makes more sense to drive. Yeah. Right? Like, I took it because I went on the TTC, it was an hour and 40 minutes from my door, and if I went to the Weston station, yeah. it was an hour yeah. to here, but $12, $24 round trip, and I haven't left the city yet. <laughs> so my question to you is, can you put a maximum fare? Are you looking into that? Like, just use whatever you want, up yours train, go train, whatever is close to you, TTC, anything that works for you, go, tr go bus, one fare, maximum five bucks. Done. And then do the same in the 905. At you. And, and you can cross over. At you. So, so yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, the, we, we know fares are very complicated. So I think there, there's several steps to go forward. The first one is uh, overall to make these crossovers that you mentioned uh, more kind of smooth and don't and stop having these double fares at the crossover. So when when you're doing a small distance, when you when you're living on one side of the, um, the municipal border right. on the other, then you you can have a really high penalty. There are many models to do this. There is fare by distance. There is there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Uh, there is capping for reg for regular users. So there are many different mechanisms. Right. We're working with all of the agencies together to try to see on a regional perspective and what makes can, sense. If I can just add, um, again, we're not always great at explaining stuff, and I apologize for that. But um, the, the fares is not all set by us. So sometimes, sometimes we're not clear to say. So, so fares are set by the different agencies. And so, right. so, so when we... When we set fares, we set only fares on, on go and on up, up express. Right. And so, <laughs> okay, I got you saying it almost. <laughs> so, so, so we don't set the fares on the others. And I, think, and I think this is the challenge we have in the region is that there are so many different people set fares. Well, this is where yeah. I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking at other models? Like just charge every household 25 bucks and call it a transit, give them the Presto card. See, this is drug dealing 101. Give them the drug. <laughs> free, first hit's free, <laughs> okay? You give them the Presto card, charge them 25 bucks, call it a regional transit, tax, whatever, fare. Charge, I'm a, I'm a, I, don't, I don't take transit, I drive. Because yeah. the way I, my job, I need to drive. The problem you described is very real. We, right. we, we, we need to make transit as cost effective for people to use as possible. And so, so the, you, you, the problem you describe is real. If for a moment, just talk about um, Go, uh, Up Express. Up Express has grown so much. Um, the trains are now so full at the peak times during the day and large parts during the day. Probably, at, probably this time of night, it starts to slow down. Um, and we have real, real massive demand there. Now, and, and the issue just is, if, if you start to drop prices even more, then it gets more congested. So it, there's a little bit of quirks in. in no, no, I get that. Yeah. But like you're running empty trains to Stouffville, and I just took the up train, and there's only two cars. I think you can run three as a set, right? I just came at 5 o'clock, and there's a room standing, which is OK. But there's still room for another car. We, we do have two cars and three cars. Yeah. Right. So they at, at, at the peak. That's what I'm saying. We run it in three. And, and when, the, when it starts to slow down, we run it as two. Yeah, no, I get that. It used to that. be a little bit more. But um, 
like what can you not start running them? Okay, they run every 15 so, minutes, run them every seven. So if I can, I just want right. you have, there's a few <laughs> folks behind you. I, I want you to know what, you. I, what I do want to do is let's we'll just, catch you, know, you after. We do look at okay. ridership and we look at revenue and, and we are trying to simplify and we're looking at options to simplify. Can, can we we'll connect with you? Can we connect with you? We'll, we'll, take, we'll take the discussion Thank you. forward. Fair enough. Next question, please. Hi, my name, ooh, sorry. Hi, my name is Sharon, and um, I'm just here actually to support Shanta as well. I live in the same community, and um, I just wanted to share some of my experience too, and, and in regards to um, how it affects the community, but I would say, I would go beyond saying it affects just the community and the people there. It ripples out everywhere to where we work and all of those different places, because I've noted, um, I myself have noticed a significant difference in um, my sleep with those new trains. So at first we moved to the community before the barriers were put in and we were woken up regularly at 11.30, 5.30 in the morning. That was kind of normal and it was exhausting because I'm sort of new to the community. Then those barriers came in and we were just so grateful. So for anyone, I'm here also to speak on behalf of those additional barriers that are in need of going in. They make an enormous difference in yeah. people's lives yeah. uh, in terms of the whistles. And so those went in, but then your new trains came in. So I can almost be guaranteed 11.50, woken up, 12 o'clock, woken up, and then um, it seems like it's morning. <laughs> and I work in a I work with young children, so I'm totally in support of the eco initiatives. That's my job at my school, is to um, initiate those green initiatives. I've done that for the last five years. I love the fact that we're trying to reduce carbon emissions, and I support you in that. And I support, I understand that you want the efficiency, but I do believe that we have to think about the impact of everybody else and the quality of life. And in terms of saying um, that you consider the community, I don't believe that can be completely true because one of those tracks is right beside a nursing home. My father's in that nursing home, but it's not just that. It's just there's like hundreds of people at a pretty tough time in their life, and those trains are just going through like repetitively, and the horn, the whistles started again. So even where the tracks were, where the whistles stopped, the whistles started up again. And so that was a significant, that communication, I don't know what happened with the, the train drivers or where, how that happened, but it's, it's, they're louder again. So we've just noticed a significant difference. It affects my job for sure. I work with little kids and I work with, I'm a special education teacher. So I work with kids with high needs and you need to be patient. Okay. So, thank you and for sharing. sleep is everything. Thank you for sharing. Okay, can, we, can we afterwards just catch up on that? Where that area is where you think the whistles have restarted? Uh, it was around uh, Highway 7 and Kennedy right. in that area and right, right around there. They, at 12.50, 12 o'clock, 12 just, I mean, it was, I knew the time. Like, I now know the time, 11.50, 12 o'clock. And it's just like, you know, you're just trying to fall asleep. And it's not just me, though. I, I really am saying it really affects your day and everybody in your day. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Hi there. My name is Peter Tappins. I'm the MPP for Toronto Danforth. And I have a few questions, and I'll make them as quick as I can. I just want to note that I have a number of colleagues here. Rima Burns McGowan, who's the MPP for Beaches East York. Uh, Dolly Begum, the MPP for Scarborough Southwest. And Ari Bibikian, the MPP for Scarborough Asian Court. My riding, Toronto Danforth, is um, one of those ridings that's going to have a fair amount of effects from the work that you're doing. And there's strong support in my riding for transit. I've talked to an awful lot of people. There's no question about that. People are frustrated that they can't get to work and they can't get home. But I have questions both on the south end of the Ontario line and the north end, because I have people here who are dealing with the north end and the south end. At the south end, uh, Mr. Verster, I'm assuming, uh, you said that the line had to be above ground because of the necessity of making the connection at East Harbour and getting over the Don River. And fair enough, I'm willing to accept that. But frankly, you can be below ground all the way down to eastern and then you have the ability to come up at that point you eliminate at, by doing that the disruption of the parks uh, the elimination of a community center and the difficulties we're going to face with many people's homes which are within now 15 meters of what will be these rail lines those are substantial problems that you can avoid by going underground. So I'd like to ask you, I don't know if you can answer it right now, um, to reconsider and put or keep the line underground until you get south of Eastern. 
and you can deal with the two problems that you raised earlier with one of my constituents. So that's one end. At the north end, people have seen a line in your interim business case which has caused a huge amount of anxiety, both because people didn't realize that this was coming, and, and I'll contrast this with the TTC, who engaged in a number of public meetings with the community, both with the relief line and their proposed north line, mm. so that at least the community got used to the idea this is something we're gonna have to deal with, and my constituents here were very shocked to see in the paper, some of them on vacation, hey, you're gonna have a subway line coming up your street, and your home's gonna be expropriated. So I'd urge you to do a few things. One, meet with people now. I've met with people, but I'll tell you, other than what you had on your website, I didn't have information to give them, but I felt they absolutely have to have a public meeting where we could get their input. So don't just take the least amount of consultative time that's allowed under the TPAP. Talk to people now because I saw in the process for the relief line, we actually were able to resolve a number of design problems that we wouldn't have resolved otherwise. And as much as it was difficult in the community, we actually came out with an approach that people could support. And I, I say that from having canvassed up and down that whole line and talked to people in their homes. That, that, that so, is excellent. That's excellent advice. And can I, can, if I, if I can just lead into, and, and the team will respond to that, that is the strategy that we do have. And, and, and we just want to have something firm to come to the community and, and present to the community. And I think that's what starts in January. Uh, I'll just put one other question, and I'm very happy to hear what people have to say, and I know my constituents will be the same way. I gather there's already staking and what looks like preparation for geo, geophysical or geological studies on Minton Place at this point. It's been our understanding that so far, the line that's been drawing has been conceptual. Um, can you tell us whether it's Metrolinx that's doing that staking and I assume drilling or not? And if it is, is you, does that mean that you've precluded any other uh, route through the north end? We've not precluded anything yet. So, so getting the geotechnical surveys going is part of the preparation of understanding what, what the actual soil and, and underground conditions are. That does not preclude any other discussion. It doesn't preclude what we do in consultation. It's just sort of part of the engineering preparation to see how, what the actual soil um, underground conditions are. And that can help us with um, with figuring out what the timeline is within which we can go to market to start to talk to the market about what the alignment or the root the root position would be. You, Kelly, you were going to refer to your staff. To yeah, it. Kelly and, and Susan, perhaps. Yeah. No, and that is one of the reasons why we do want to come to the community, both informally and formally, to do those PICs that we're really used to doing. So very similar to the work that we do with the Lake Shore East uh, Community Advisory Committee um, is really about sitting down and rolling up our sleeves and learning about the needs of the community and talking to them about what we know at that time, doing exactly what you just said you do and hearing from them first, even if we don't have a lot of information to share. So, and can you give us a sense of your schedule and timeline? So we I know, know people are very anxious. Yeah, about. we know that we're going to have some open houses at the end of January. Um, and so maybe what we can do is endeavor to kind of get more firm schedules out to your office even and, and start connecting with the right people um, who maybe we can sit it's down. It's pretty easy, actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I'll make sure that we've got all of the right contact information so that we can reach out with you directly. And okay. Yeah. Kelly, when we start to do that, we do letter drops in the, we do. In, in yeah. the area. So, so the For the Ontario line, for the open houses, we're doing, we're dropping 150,000 postcards. So everything in Not the study, yeah, I think that's pretty, <laughs> pretty conclusive. Everything that's anywhere near the, stu the study line, we're letting you know we're coming. Okay, and just to wrap up, I would ask you to seriously consider keeping the line underground until you get to Eastern, because the two issues you raised with my constituent earlier, crossing the Don River and being at grade at East Harbor can be addressed without being above ground north of Eastern. 
And with that, I thank you. Helpful. Thank you very much, sir. So I know that we are now over time, and I know we still do have five people um, in line. We are open to staying afterwards, but um, we really do need to start to bring to, to an end. Um, do we, do we take one more? Take one more question. Um, a more. Please. A more. If we could make the questions quick. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll be quick. So my name is Corey Branch. So the question I have is, with the recent outcry in Ottawa over the Confederation line, over being on time, on budget, delivery and performance of the lineup there, and the disaster has been, has Metrolinx considered reconsidering using the P3 model when it comes to building transit in Toronto? It's a great question, thank you. Yeah, superb question. So, so we've actually written out to the market and indicated to the market that we are thinking about how the P3 model works and that we want to consider different ways of proceeding into the future with, with how we buy these projects. Uh, and and I, I, I think P3s is, when you think of a P3 model, there's not just one P3, there are sort there's, of different- There's several. Yeah, like, different, different the, the general problem I'm having here with it is, well, I'll ask you this question. Can you name me a successful P3 in terms of any P3 applied to transit, where it's both coming on time and on budget, anywhere in the world or anywhere in Ontario specifically? Like one question I have is, what's the cost overrun on the Eglinton Crosstown? And what was the original deadline when it comes to building it? Because from what I understand, they're way past both deadlines. No, they're not. Oh, they're so, not? So, no, no, but it's a good question. <laughs> so, in terms of models of P3s that have worked perfectly, there are quite a raft of examples of P3s that have worked well in transit in other parts of the world. In, 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 but there's also as many that have not worked well. So let, there's, there's your, your point is very valid. Mm -hmm. When you look at whether it's a P3 model or a normal model, on what's called mega projects in transit, typically throughout the world, um, there's about 40% of mega projects that miss schedule and miss budget. And, and the reason for that is these mega projects have lots of complexities and system integration. The example you referred to in Ottawa is one of those where the these projects have inordinate complexity, and they and, and they sometimes go wrong. So, what are you doing to prevent that from happening with yeah. the Caroline so, Scarborough extension? So, so this is this is why th there is no silver bullet or a single contracting model that actually works out as the perfect answer. Throughout the world, agencies like our own are looking for what's the best technique to get these models or to get these mega projects to work well. And so if, if I just give, give one small snapshot perhaps of this, the, the big thing on a P3 model is it's sort of a fixed price where you say to the contractor, right, we've now dis discussed all of this, you're gonna bid all of this and get a fixed price. And, and the trend in the world over the last 15 years are that if you have less of that fixed price ring fence it and you have more of a collaborative model where you say, Come in, contractor, work shoulder to shoulder. Let's understand what the risks are. Let's understand what's, for example, the underground conditions. Because when they bid, they don't know what's going on on the ground where they're going to dig a tunnel. So how do you work together with a contractor to find the right time and effort to get to a price, a price point where all of the risks are known and you can say, right now we're in a better place to say what the schedule and price can be. So it some, sometimes sounds, um, when you think of a P3 model or this model or that model, as if there's any one model that works. The trend throughout the world now is, is, is rather that there's no single perfect model. It depends on what risks you have on the project and how you create collaboration between the contractor and the agency. And then thirdly, with communities and municipalities and everyone to get everyone to work on towards the same objective. So if the model that you're saying here is not consistent, because what you're telling me right now, what I'm hearing is it produces a lot of mixed results. And mixed results leads to delays and cost overruns in, most, in some of the cases you're listing here. So if that's the case, then why use the model at all? So, why don't you use something more consistent? Just so, abolish the P3 altogether. So, so, so what we're setting about to do now is we, we're using in that sort of continuum of P3 type of models, yeah, because P3 models is basically a partnership, different forms of partnership. Yeah, public-private partnership. Yeah, yeah public-private partnership. So we're looking for, we, we are, we, we've developed over the last six, six months or so a, a public-private partnership model 
that will give us the highest degree of certainty and the highest degree of certainty on schedule and the highest degree of certainty on cost. And we are busy talking to the market now. Over the last three weeks, we've had what we call market soundings with contractors throughout the world um, about how this model would work, for, would, would work with them and for them so that we can get better understanding of whether the risk transfer is effective. And so, the, the, still your question is an excellent one because what we need to achieve here is a solution for each of the four lines, which may be slightly different de depending on the risk for the different lines. And we're setting up our procurement accordingly. The, the, the alternative is um, just a different form of buying it, and it's as uncertain as, as a P3. Have you guys done any research into any alternative, alternative motives? I'd be glad to share it with you. So I, th I think we are going to have to bring the session to an end. I know there are four let people. Him, let him, let him get so. Okay. I, I, I was okay. Please, let's was, complete the line. Okay. Let's complete the line. I was going to offer that we would actually speak to people. So no, that's okay. Absolutely. Let's complete the line. It's a very direct question. I think one of the issues that is underlining the same consensus here this evening is that Metrolinx has a very bad track, re track record at being heard by the community. There's lots of, we have Shanta, we have the, uh, the lady from the dog park, we have MPPs representing their constituents here this evening. So my question to you, and I had examples, but I know we're kind of cutting it short on time, is what is exactly is Metrolinx going to do to improve communications with the communities to kind of have more of a, uh, that we're all on the same page as these areas get developed? Because I think we probably would have a lot more frustrated people here this evening if we felt part of the solution versus the approaches that's been taken by Metrolinx to this date based off their history with that. So I've got to tell you, this is why we're here. So to, no, hear, so, so to hear, and, and tonight, I heard, tonight I heard a lot of things, and I heard things that, that, have really, that will really st stick with me in terms of what, what, what we were thinking, we were doing in terms of communication, and where we thought it was, was, thought was effective. I've heard tonight that there are many areas where our communication is not working as well as we, we, as we can make it work. So tonight has been immensely helpful for me as an insight. And I, and I think, I, I, I want to say to everyone in this room, I thank you for your feedback. And, and I can see we need to communicate better. I can see that. And, and I appreciate the openness. And I appreciate the feedback. And, and I think Kelly and Susan and Kelsey and, and, and Mark, I think, we need to go back and think about how we communicate with communities on all of these key issues, which we have a very good sense of, but which I don't think we may, that we succeed to get the message across as well. And so we need to be, get better at this. And I, and I think we're going to take that away and do that. And if I can say, we're, we're going to be back. So we, 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 I, I insist that Metrolinx as an organization I insist, we st I started this with this theme, that we go out to the <laughs> communities and we listen and we hear, and we'll be back. And so in a year's time, by all means, tell us if, if they, I would want us to be a lot better in a year's time when we sit in front of you again, or six months time or whenever we're gonna be here again. So would you be willing to put forth a plan of action to the people here this evening? Without a doubt. I think one of the things Kelly is yeah. going to take away is we're going to, we, we, we're going to and, and Susan's going to take away, and, and Kelsey's going to take away, and we, we, we'll, we'll, all of the people that we meet after this meeting will gather the information and we'll figure out what that plan of action looks like. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I live in Unionville, and <coughs> I, uh, every time a train goes by and does not blast our eardrums, I say a little prayer of thanks to Shanta. And so I just want to say that. My other point is that the, just although the um, trains are sort of not accessible to me, I would like to take them to go downtown, but um, I live in the heritage area of Unionville, as do most Unionvillians. Uh, I, it's a little far to walk. Um, I don't plan on buying a bicycle at my age. Um, 
I don't want an Uber. I, uh, there is an occasional shuttle, but I had an interesting experience. It turns out I have to pull, pay full fare there if I'm going south. If I'm going north, I can show my pl train ticket and I get a reduced rate. That seems strange. I've written several times to various organizations saying, could they get their act together and never got an answer or any action at all. Um, so the more general issue, and, and the parking lot is full, of course, it goes without saying. So the general issue is there should be some kind of a shuttle network that feeds into the GO station. You're not going to get, be able to build up any ridership unless people can actually get to the station. So that's basically what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I, I fully agree. I think we're, we're working very closely with uh, <coughs> York Region to, to increase bus services to Unionville Go, and, and there's a lot of, and, and I think that's the right solution to be, because as you said, you're, you're right, the distances are too far to walk. So I think there the right solution is to increase uh, local transit that can really go by the different communities and bring them to the GO station. Thanks, Matthew. Next question. I, I live in uh, five, sec five seconds from Gilbert GO station. I work at just across the street almost from Agent Court uh, GO station. Take it to Union and back. I, lo I love it. A lot of the Stovin line, the, all the stations seem to be in construction and they got the, the wonderful uh, staff at the, what's it called, the accessible, uh, accessible car. They say, welcome, my name's Blah. If you go into this station, we'll forward, we'll move back, blah, blah, blah. I'm hard of hearing. As you, you, you can see this FM transmitter, I'm not listening to a Blue Juice game. People, uh, or whatever sports, uh, people of hard of hearing can't hear, uh, can't hear that. that. There's a myth that just because uh, you have full hearing, I'm 41, that you have to be in your 80s, 90s uh, to lose your hearing. I've been losing my hearing since I was about tw uh, tw uh, 27. I read lips. I know zero sign language that involves more than one finger. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way you, you can put, you know, like a text, text, you know when you go on, 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 yeah. on the TTC subway, they have on top in there, it says go this side or, or this side or the next side. Something like that, uh, because I, I always, if I'm riding in, in the back train in Cameron Milliken or one of those, when I go, then I have to walk and the train only stays there for like, like a few seconds. You know, isn't there a way of something like a non-audio? You know, I had one of my, the regular guys that takes, you know, takes the same time, he gets his cell phone, his cell phone and, and, and starts type, typing in us and, and shows me everything, but I don't always take the same, the same train. That that guy is is wonderful, awesome, but you know, can you do something? Oh, thank you very much. That's very useful to uh, uh, to know, actually. I mean, on some of our uh, cars now, we do have some digital displays, but I must admit they are fewer rather than many. And I'll take back what you have said. I think that's uh, been very well put, and it's something that we need to consider more of. So thank you very much. And not just the Stover line, every other line. Whatever. Well, I'll yeah. take it on all the Go Transit. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Last question. Hi, um, my name is Masood Mahajir. I live in Unionville, uh, in the old village of Unionville. I take the train downtown quite often, and I've noticed that you've got these noise abatement measures going into place, these wonderful looking barriers. Yeah. It reminds me of jumping into East Berlin sometimes in 1960. <laughs> um, given that I live in the heritage village of Unionville, could I just ask, do you have plans in place to bring these barriers into Unionville, and if you do, would those barriers be sympathetic to the heritage nature of our village? So I actually, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to your question, because I don't know um, exactly where we will be putting up noise mitigation yet. Um, there is a study, like I said earlier, that will be going on with respect to the entire network of GO expansion and noise and, and noise mitigation that will be required across the network. Right. Um, and those studies are ongoing. We'll be back in the, out in the communities in the new year to talk about that. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't speak to your, to your specific location and example. Not, to, not tonight. No, I can't speak to it tonight. Yeah. But when the study is done, we should be able to talk to that. Can I expect it in my lifetime sometime? The, the consultation, absolutely, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Right. We will be, right. okay. we will be out, as we said earlier, we'll be out um, okay. uh, in, in the new year to talk right. about that. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Uh, just like, I would like to thank everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thanks for being and, and attending this evening. Thanks to everyone that's online watching us. Um, obviously, um, we appreciate very much your open feedback, uh, the candid dialogue, and as, as Phil uh, very eloquently articulated, um, hearing feedback and listening and, and, and hearing your concerns are something that we take very seriously um, because we, we do want to make a difference in the communities uh, with, within which we, we participate with you. Um, any questions that were um, addressed online um, uh, that were not answered um, this evening, we will be posting in the few, next few business days on the MetroLinksEngage.com site. Uh, and with that, uh, on behalf of the team, uh, we'd like to thank the Scarborough Civic Center for hosting us, the community for uh, allowing us to be here this evening, and for you all for joining us. Please travel safe home. Um, have a great night. Thank you very much. Thank you.